I assume. Yeah, there it is. All right. <laughs> we are live. Well, tonight, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're listening on the 16th of February, welcome as well. We have a very special episode tonight. We are coming live from the interwebs. And tonight I have with me Scott. How's it going, Scott? Good. How are you doing, John? Outstanding. Happy for you to join us. We also have TJ in D.C. Hey, everyone. Doug in what looks like the International Space Station. I am in a Crew Dragon <laughs> capsule from SpaceX. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. How you doing? And then lastly, and certainly not least, our special guest for this evening, coming to us from New England, the very talented scale modeler, Adam Wilder. Thanks so much for joining us, Adam. How are you tonight? Thank you, guys. I am doing good, and it's Friday. G-I-F. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, GIF for sure. <laughs> So tonight we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep it casual. We're gonna keep it discussion based. And listeners, uh, if you're tuning in live right now, free feel to pop, feel free to populate any questions you want. Scott's gonna be our quarterback tonight, looking through them, post them on the screen, and asking Adam them when they come up. And hopefully, it'll create some unique discussion topics that we haven't covered before. And nice. What's up, Travis? So the first segment we're going to do, I'm going to actually pass this back over to Scott, but we're going to share a screen. So if you're listening on the podcast, we'll be posting these photographs on our website, and then you can go on and follow along by clicking along. But the first thing we're going to do is look at Adam's latest project, which is the SU-101. So take it away, Scott. <clears throat> yeah, Adam, we kind of uh, talked about this a little bit the first time you joined it, but... Sure. Um, Love, love your tank destroyers, love your finish. But a lot of people, you know, they ask us, like, how do we get, how do you get your finishes to go from this, you know, high intensity modulation to the end result, which is just, you know, always so incredible. So uh, maybe you could uh, talk to us a little bit about this build. Okay, sure. Um, this is like the first one where I've really gotten into the color modulation like I did in the old, like I did I say the old days, I don't know, back uh, six or seven years ago. And I decided to, and I've learned over the years, although, you know, I started working on it this past summer, it was the middle of summer, really hot. And uh, I, I don't know, I just started with the gradients and then I went over it, you know, I brush paint a lot of the details with the greens. Um, I'll be honest, um, the green on those um, amber uh, guards over the vents and on parts of the muffler wasn't quite the green I was looking for, but it still had enough red in it. To, and I knew after the washes and everything, I knew I could correct it by adding the um, you know filters with oils and uh, other techniques in the weathering and, and even the chip, and believe it or not, is a big part of it too. Uh, and I just, I didn't let it scare me because I've dealt with it so many times and I've even carried it further than this on more difficult subjects. And um, I, as I just went through the steps, you know, with a, a, a style like this, you can, you know, you can use oil paints, you can uh, use the chipping, you can use washes and filters and you um, you can add as much as you want until you bring it down to where everything kind of matches just enough, but where it sticks out enough from the different colors. Because remember, those are different pieces. And uh, sometimes, you know, where they're sticking up, you can put lighter colors on them where the pieces that are that are lower on the model, you can keep a little dark and uh, you're not really going to notice it because those pieces might be brighter anyway because of how the sun's shining on them or even just what you want to draw attention to. Uh, if you want to, can I ask you to go back to that original? Sure. You had up there, please. Let's see. Yeah, look at the Commander's Cupola uh, and those two hatches on top. That that got me a little nervous. Like, oh, man, they're on the gray. I went a little too light. What am I going to do? And then you go back to the one you just had up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you know, you can just keep, if you have to, you can blend on heavy, heavy washes of oils or do what, um, it's a type of filter, they call it like the dot technique, uh, in which to me is just another type of filter. Uh, you can just add the tones and, and bring it to, um, bring it more 
how can I say it to make the colors more blend together better? Now, the big thing is, so I'll say, and if I'm talking too much, just tell me. The, um, the you want to make sure, again, can I have you step back? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. And you, okay. I'll go back to the first one. Yeah, I, and, and this thing is finished. I, 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 all right. The at this point, I'd hit it with so many coats of Tamiya Clear to really gloss it up because you're going to want a worn satin appearance on the finished vehicle because that will really contrast nicely with the matte earth tones. So, you know, when you're like oil paints dry pretty matte because they, they have a lot of um calcium in them that that. And that, I think it's the same material they put in, like, the Tamiya paints to make the, have those dry to a matte finish, too, like the XF colors. So the other going to dry, uh, again, to a very matte finish. So that's going to bring down that gloss tone a bit. So you got to – where's you going to be adding a lot of oils? You want to make sure you – don't be afraid to overdo the gloss because that will all come down with the weathering and the filters and the washes. And um, anyway, yeah. That's kind of, again, I didn't really, I wasn't really nervous. And I, I kind of do like the way it came out. And I'll be honest, it's this one here, it's become a personal favorite of mine. Now that it's done and I've seen the final photos, I'm just waiting for the figure before I drop it on um, missing links and Instagram and everything. Yeah, yeah, I think you've got a future as an armor modeler, Adam. <laughs> I think I might want to look into it more. Yeah, I think you might want to yeah investigate that. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. And you guys get some ideas and some <laughs> stuff that help you out. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. You know, Adam, I, I want to call out. You, you know, and I'm going to go back to this initial photograph. Um, you know, you, you talk about accentuating the colors and really making them pop. And it was yeah. interesting. There was a post online this past week on Facebook where a gentleman had posted his modulated T34, and he was kind of scared that he overdid it. And I think I, 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 you saw, you saw I, it, I believe. I was in that conversation. I said, yeah. no, I said, no, keep going. That, that was yeah. awesome. That was very well done. Yeah. And and I think that's so important to remember is you, you get these extreme tones but at the end of the day, after you've added all the weathering, I mean, without the extreme, it, it looks like you would have just base coated it in a simple like one or two colors. So it just adds so much up front and, you know, having the cojones to keep going on it because what you've done here is is absolutely awesome. And something that TJ and I talk about always, too, with uh, with our small group yeah. chat. Yes. And if you look, you get like on that front, that front plate, you can still see the gradient. It is there mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. enough. Uh, to add that, you know, the volumes and everything. And, you know, you look at the front of the fenders where they come up to the top where it's lighter. Again, it's, it's, it, that, and that's, that's the thing with color modulation that a lot of people mess up on is, uh, it's just part of it. All those tones are just part of it. They go in conjunction with the chipping and the weathering and, you know, rain, rain marks, uh, how, you know, effects with grease, uh, spilt fuel. It's mm -hmm. just part of it because when that's all done, it's going to be toned down, and, and when you, it's when you try to make it about the actual gradients in the style, it, that's when it becomes obvious, and that's when you overdo it, and that's when you run into problems. Yeah, but never be scared. Like that guy with the T thirty four. What was his name? I'll I'll look it up and make sure we post it on our web page. Sure. Yeah. Um, while while Jones got this shot up, Adam, I want to ask you if you look at the tracks there. The, the thing that I've always loved about your modeling is that every single element on the model, each track link, each bolt, each weld, it all tells a separate individual story. Okay. So when you're when you're planning your finish, are you looking at it as each of these is an individual element to the overall um, finish? Or are you just kind of building a base and then zeroing in on each detail as it happens? I mean, what's your approach? Um, I think what you want to do is, and I'm, I'm, let me see, let me try to answer your question. Um, I try to give everything a completely different look. The weathering is going to bring it together. I'm looking for a word there. Um, it's, it's not harmonize. It's another word. Um, it's going to bring it together a little bit, but prior to the weathering, I, I put everything I try to paint everything differently. The big thing on this thing that I went kept going back to because I just couldn't get it 
to uh, look right was that exhaust, that big exhaust up by the gun. Uh, that I, I don't know how many times I, that one there. And at the same time, I'm trying to do a step by step photo for an article. So I'm thinking, well, and I'll just be honest in the article, I just had a hard time getting the end result I wanted. And I don't know how many pictures I went online. So again, trying to make that look different. And because, the, all right, this gets back to your question. I'm sorry, I went off on a tan. Um, the, uh, if you, I had it chipped just, although I used the colors of the exhaust, I had it chipped and it looked just a lot like the rest of the vehicle, just chipped more. Okay. I yeah. wanted it to stick out or what you like to say, pop. So I, and I realized that when I thought I was done it, you know, and a lot of times you think about the stuff like when you're laying in bed at night or in the morning when you're too lazy to get up. And so I came up and I just found some photos and I just hit it with those, you know, like that pink on the end and, and just changed, just changed the whole, and masked everything around and just airbrushed some of that pink on and very lightly. And that, that gave it the look I wanted. And every time I look at these photos to kind of judge my own work, that's the one thing I go back to. Well, you made that look good, you know? So, um, Another thing, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, here's another thing, that vent on top, that big screen, that was a – that. I think it's great that Trump put this kit on the market because I, I love this subject. It's not a very popular subject, but I love the look of it. And um, – that, but that screen is just lacking a tremendous amount of detail. And it gave you a big, thick Verlinden style, like photo etch type thing to put on there. And uh, that works for some things. But for this, in the photos I had, I took myself at Kubinka, they were, um, that screen was actually very fine. And it was just on a, uh, in a, like a, like a um, screen. With, it was a screen that had a little frame around it that would have got bent up easy. So I'm like, oh, I can do all kinds of fun stuff with that. And, that that was just that's another detail i was glad i put the work into it, even though it was a, a bit of a nail biter at times yeah yeah for sure so adam dcc uh s says i'm not an armor guy what is it what is the subject oh okay yeah thanks for the question actually um it is a soviet self-propelled gun and it's a prototype they made three of them and I know there was at least three. Let me say that. Let me reset. There was at least three of them because you have this one that's in Kubinka with this 100 millimeter on it. There was one with a 122 mounted on it that I've seen in the black and white photos. And there's one that has a little. Um, there it has like a little vision port that's been cut out of the front of that front plate there that I've seen in photographs too. And I'll, I'll put those up when I when I put the model up in a, in a few weeks once I get the figure. So yes, it is a. Um, it's a Soviet. It's a. It came out in nineteen forty six, I think. It's on the T forty four chassis, and there was a, only a few of them built. That's the uh, SU one hundred and one. Is that right? Yes, it's the SU one hundred and one. Excuse okay. me. It was like the. It was kind of be like the next step from the SU one hundred. Awesome and. Then and then, Adam, uh, this yeah. this finished model, is it going to be featured like in a video or in an article in a magazine? Uh, when when will we be able to see some more shots of this uh, beautiful model? Um, I'll put the shots up on um, the Facebook again on my Facebook page, maybe in about um, it, it probably two or three weeks. It just depends on how much, how, how quick uh, I can get the figure sent back to me from the guy who's painting it for me. And then he's in Europe. So I got to talk to him how to get it back quickly. Cause I, I'm not going to wait another two months for it. <laughs> it took two months to get there, you know? So awesome. it will it'll be on Facebook. It'll be an Instagram. And as far as the article, I'm not sure yet. Awesome. Well, Adam, you know, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it and the finished result. I, I got to say, I have that kit from Trumpeter. I've started it. And uh, I'm, I'm like torn. Do I do I build it and, and try to, uh, you know, mimic what you've done here? I'm just trying to think of what I can do to make it a little bit unique because what you've done is absolutely fantastic, especially yep. with that single green color. Well, um, I don't know. I was influenced by a model or two who did that. And he put his up with all the fenders and everything broken off. Mm. I'm like, well, I'll do mine with all the fenders on it. <laughs> and, uh, and he did. I did mine. He also used color modulation, and um, I ended up. I'm gonna put a picture of his up when I put mine up too. And uh, 
how would I recommend you do it? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to really think about it. I was thinking whitewash potentially. Yep, that's that's yeah, that's another way to that we haven't seen it yet. Sure, or you know, like a maybe a simple camouflage. Yeah, but I'd have to think about it. Or put it with Polish markings or something. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, and, and, the Eastern block. and the modeler you're mentioning, I'm pretty sure he's out of South Korea, I believe. Yeah, it's um, a, I, I'm afraid to say his name because I don't want to butcher it. I'm so, I, so sorry. I, I know exactly who you're talking about. We'll be sure to share those photos on our Facebook mm, page. Yeah. He pushed the modulation a lot, and he's got some extra tracks on it, and mm. he's – He's really good. Uh, he yeah. also did a Korean War Sherman that was modulated very and well. He's a really nice guy too. I met him yeah. when I was in um, Singapore. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, he came over and say hi, and just great guy. Nice. Well, we're going to go on to another segment now, Adam, and this sure. is this is where we're going to rewind the clock. Uh, we're going to go back to the earliest days of scale modeling, uh, back you know in the Y two K era. So yep. I'm going to ask Scott to allow me to share my screen again, and then we're going to just go through some older uh, show photos. Some of them it's going to be your work, and some of them going to be other modelers that probably we haven't talked about in a long time, but. This one right here, I wanted to put this up because I think this is awesome. And it was built by John Rosengrant back in the day. And I don't know if you ever had a oh, chance wow. to meet him. I Have I met John Rosengrant? I don't think so. Because he would come to AMPS and he would put a few things on the table. And this is one that stuck out. And now instead of, you know, I still think he does armor models, but... He's also the uh, master over at um, Legacy Effects that's doing Baby Yoda. So he's 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 a legend. Okay, yeah, okay. I thought I'm, I thought I might have been mixing up with someone else. No, I, I don't think I have met him, but yeah. uh, he, he or maybe I have. Um, I don't know. I spoke to him on the phone or something. He's like a really nice guy. Yeah, yeah. He was he, he's a he's a legend. Sculpt falls yeah. on work. So the next one. This guy, you should probably know, but Bob Kalignan. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know <laughs> Bob Kalignan, man. Yeah, sure. That's going back to the day, too. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, getting some ideas from his old fine-scale modeler articles, like that um, That little rubber-tipped uh, – it's called an artist sharpener. It looks like a paintbrush, but it has a little rubber tip on it. He was the first yeah. one I saw to use that. Use that. So, and I – when I bought the, one of those at the art store, and I, I use that for blending um, graphite on tracks and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, nice, but Bob. Yeah, he's like a wasn't he like a big? No, he wasn't. There was a lot of scratch builders at the um, part of that EMS organization, but he you know, he kind of stuck with the armor and the bases. And I'm a, yeah, yeah, nice guy. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is another one. Unfortunately, I don't know the modeler, but this was all the way back in 2002. And I, and I wanted to throw this up on here because I, I think it just shows, like, when you think of older armor finishes, maybe wash and dry brush, but there were some guys back then that were really pushing it. And this was one example I thought was unbelievable. And, and I remember that one. You know why? Because you can see where uh, the whitewash didn't go up around where the tarp was initially attached. Yeah. And I remember thinking, well, why didn't I think of that? That's a, <laughs> well, I, I remember that one, but I love that subject too. That's that trumpeter kit, correct? So here's the thing. This was before the trumpeter kit was released. So okay. who was the kit? I'm, that's a great question. I need to do some research. I tried before the show, and uh -huh. I I honestly think it was either scratch built or a heavily modified like in souped up resin kit because it was it was incredible. Well, look at the detail in that thing, though, for, for like a, a multimedia kit like that or a resin kit. Yeah. And look at that winter camouflage. It looks like uh, blended enamels. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. I it mean, is. And, and I mean, again, it goes back before the hairspray technique and a lot of the common things we know today. Yeah. And, and I feel so bad. I don't know the modeler who built this, but uh, I'll do some research and try to find well, if I can. Hopefully one of the viewers here can, can give us some help. Yeah. I, re I remember that one. I remember someone pointed that, that this one out to me. Yeah. Let's what year was that, John? This was 2002. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. So 20 years ago. And, I mean, this finish holds up to, the, to today's standards. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It sure does. I like yeah. the weather, too. That, I love that the earth tones. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, viewers, you know, these pictures aren't that great because they're actually scanned from, 
you know, film pictures and the, the next, the next round, the next, you know, once we go to 2003 is when I got my digital camera. So um, this was right after John's <laughs> sketching stage. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see what else I have here. So Adam, this was built by a gentleman, Tom Cockle. Um, you know him, he's from the missing links, uh, you know, era expert in Panzer fours. I just thought I'd throw it up because he's yeah. really well known. He, uh, I talked to John Cockle on the phone one day. For he called me up one set Sunday afternoon, just we were talking about publishing. Talked to him on the phone for about an hour. That's awesome. And, um, nice guy, and yeah, like a lot of like he used a lot of uh, sheet styrene and mm -hmm. for the detailing. Yeah, and I remember that because I could never make, I could never make. I was not at that time. I just wasn't as good as he was with using um, the, the you know the evergreen. Um, you know, rods and sheets and everything. I mean, I've gotten better at it, but yeah, just the patience he showed, and the detail he did, and the different, you know, always the Panzer fours. You know, that was, yeah, Panzer four. You, it's hard to go wrong with that one. You know, it's, oh yeah, yeah. I remember him. Nice man. So here, speaking of yeah, Panzer fours, yeah, yeah. So this was again O two. <laughs> Guess what? That's downstairs in my display case. No way. Yeah. <laughs> oh <laughs> man. Yeah, I got it right here. Uh huh. That was when uh, him and I first started talking. Was that one? Um, he put that up on lakes, and I've never seen it. I've never seen anything like it. I'm not. I don't remember if he built that or not. Uh, but the painting, come on, that was that. I I hadn't seen it done like that at the time. Now Zalog had done some knocked out vehicles in the day, but not to this level. You know, this was nice. This was very professional. Uh, yeah, a lot of, and I still, like, when I'm downstairs, like, sometimes I'll go downstairs in the cell, I got two display cases, I got, but they're both, I got too much stuff, so I got one downstairs, I got one upstairs, I don't, I don't have them both in the living room, because the old display case doesn't match everything we have in the new living room with the colors of the couch and everything, it's, you know, you're living with a woman, and, um, <laughs> And, uh, but no, she's right. And I, you know, I let her do the house up the way she wants. And <laughs> but I'll go downstairs too. I get a lot of stuff downstairs, and I look at books and stuff. And uh, sometimes on a Friday night, if I'm just pacing around the basement, you know, sipping a cocktail, relaxing, you know, I look in the display case with like this one's in there, and it just brings back a lot of memories. You know, man, yeah. I I had no idea you had this. Yep, I got it. Yeah, that's cool. And shout, cool. shout out to Robbie Knopf's up in Canada, and both yep. Ray Ray Davis and John Marley from Australia that are joining our show. Yeah, from Australia. Thank you yeah. so much for uh, hanging out with us. That's great. All right, what was the question there? I just want to say thanks. Cool. So, another gentleman that hasn't I haven't seen his work lately, Adam, but a close friend of yours, I believe, from back in the day, Rhodes Williams. That's where I saw that from. Yep, I haven't spoken to Rhodes, but um, I do remember that when he had all those huge, crazy dioramas there at Amps and everything. Yeah, yeah, this was one of them. Yeah, see, I do remember that. Correct. Yes, he brought like three that year, right? And he brought them in these huge cases that were shipped there, and he had to take them apart, like in the. Um, <laughs> am I miss that right? Was yeah, that he had a, he had a couple huge ones, and I tried to find pictures of the others, but this was the only one I could find, and they were all I just remember on these massive victorian looking uh picture frames yeah i know i, I remember that too yeah well when he brought in those crates with the stuff like what did you bring a body here or something <laughs> i didn't really know him at the time you know i didn't know him. um i'm like who, who is wow that guy must be a lot busier than i am <laughs> yeah and it was good stuff too yeah, yeah. I, the one i like from him was the one with the um it was a hair having champagne or something like that mm-hmm that that was pretty creative. That was pretty. And oh my god! I, you know, after all that work, I would have been so afraid to dump the resin in there. Like, yes. Yeah. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Such a risk. Yes. Let's see, I'm going to go on to now. Now we've gone into the digital age, so everybody can, you know, <laughs> sit back and relax <laughs> and, and, not, and not not be, uh, you know, struck by the the crappy 35 millimeter. But so this is goes back to your point earlier, Adam. Steve yeah. Zaloga in his presentation of models. Well, that's a Zaloga model. I would yep. so, but yeah, I mean, I love. I always love his figures. It looks like he painted with enamels, and I do like you know those two two guys carrying the the, uh, the was that like an anti tank gun? I forgot the numeric yeah. designation for it. It's been so long. Um, 
Yeah, I, I used to love going to see his work. I, I never saw it anywhere else, and I've always, I always loved that guy's work. He's like an idol when I was a kid. I used to read all his stuff, and um, when you know, all my friends wanted to meet these, you know, musicians and everything, I just wanted to meet this guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and what I liked about him was um, he was doing. He was the only one who was really doing the Soviet stuff and doing it well. Yeah, everyone was doing a lot of German. Where this guy did the Russian stuff, and uh, in that, I think I did finally meet him at Anthem. I didn't really get a chance to talk to him much. But I, I remember they were introducing him. Hi, I'm Adam Walker. Blah, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a question with your experience. All right. Um, with your experience, a level in the level that you built, Adam, how do you keep challenging yourself and keep things fresh after all this time? Yeah, that's not easy. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I just like the one I just finished now. I, I got an effect on there I've never done before, and it, it took me a lot of thinking and uh, a lot of looking at a lot of different photos. And you can find a lot of photos of the same effect, but you got to find that all effects, even the same effects, can look a little different. You got to find the one that looks like what you want. Then you got to try to figure out how to build it up and lay so it looks authentic. And uh, it's like uh, you know, doing another primer red vehicle. I don't know if I'll ever do that or not. I feel like I've kind of done all I can with that or doing the unpainted ones with the steel finishes. I feel like I've done all I can do with that. But then, you know, maybe someday I'll see a picture or something and I'll get another idea and I'll go back to that. Um, I'm even, uh, you know, looking at some of the stuff from like uh, Sean Lynch, this the part of me too is I wouldn't mind just going back and doing them out of the box and some of the modern stuff and just, doing those um some of the different camouflages you've seen out there and that you see out there now and, and just using the weathering techniques on them and everything and uh i don't know i usually it's like uh, the e100 i'm building i don't know what i'm gonna do with that yet i've had a couple ideas that i've tossed around with friends but um you think about it, it's just a big boxy typical looking german tank okay what do i do with this you know um I I can't give you a definite answer on that question. I think it's just, which makes it a good question, actually. I think it's just uh, when you do every subject, you you got to think carefully. What can I do different to challenge myself? And a lot of it is doing something I haven't seen yet. Makes, that's what makes it fun for me. I hope that answered your question. I hope I'm not talking too much. <laughs> no, no. no, not at all. <laughs> now, who are a, who are a couple of uh, maybe? newer modelers or younger modelers, Adam, that really uh, seem to inspire you or, or their work catches your eye? There was one, uh, what was it, the uh, VK, um, that RFM kit, that Tiger prototype. It was on the cover of Armor Modeling. I um, I can't remember the artist's name, I can't remember the name of the artist, but um, I saw that when I went out and grabbed the kit. You know, I painted with a German gray and... Um, I, can, I wish I could remember his name, you know, uh, other new ones out there. I see, see, here's my problem. I'm not good with names. And usually I'm on that work on break. I'm flipping through Instagram. And if it's something nice, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll give it a comment, say great work. But, I, you know, the names there, they usually have different names on Instagram. Like I think I'm at AMP Wilder. Maybe I do call myself Adam Wilder. I don't remember, but. It's a lot, they seldom use their own names when they put their pictures up. And I apologize. I really can't answer that question. But there is there is a lot of new stuff out there. It's like, whoa, man, I, I couldn't do any better than that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so actually, Scott, as soon as you turn it off, we'll just go right back into it. Um, I have some more pictures. Now, Adam, now we're going to get into your work and bring up some of those older builds that really set the standard back in the day. And, and yeah. I remember this article from, from yeah. AFE Modeler. Yeah. And maybe walk us through, you know, you, you really tackled snow and ice here for literally the, I think the first time in print and, mm -hmm. you know, really gave a step-by-step. -step. What, what was that, you know, what was it like? Just, you know, let's just do it and jumping right in. I guess okay. Was your attitude. Um, okay. Can you repeat the question, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, if you could just kind of walk us through your approach to creating this snow and ice effect oh. when it really hadn't been done before. Yeah, that was um, 
That was like one of the first models I did. I remember when the kit came out from Tamaya, I, I emailed David Parker and I said, hey, can I do this for you? And he said, yeah, sure. You know, we've been looking for someone, blah, blah, blah. So he sent me the kit. And he, um, and when I started putting it together, you know, I, I gave it a winter camera pieces of stretched uh, clear sprue, like the clear sprue that your, that your lights come on in the kits. And I warmed them up, stretched them, cut them in sections, super glued them in place, and then used an acrylic gloss gel. I think it was like from Windsor Newton or something. And that gave them that irregular texture. And I remember thinking, at first, I'm like, well, maybe I don't want to bother with that. It's just going to take a while. But I'm like, well, no, this will make it stand out. This will be a little different. So and that was the first model where I kind of said, okay, what can I do to make this look different? Because just another T55 with typical marking. The base was uh, a friend of mine made me the wooden base. And the, uh, the snow was just uh, that Daz clay, it's called. It's like a red, rusty color clay. And I just airbrushed it white, you know, took a, I took a wheel from some other kit and some extra bits of those through model tracks and rolled it across to get the, you know, the look of the tracks, you know, the footprints from the figure. And it, the hardest thing was, was when you're shooting a, a dark maroon color, like that clay after it solidified with the white, I don't know how many coats of white it took me. <laughs> Finally, make that look like real snow because the white was, um, it wasn't opaque. So I was just airbrushing and airbrushing, like, oh my God, I'm never going to get this to work. And then, but I, you know, I used that gel for the ice effects on the wheels and the snow gave it a slushy look. Um, I remember I showed it to a friend of mine and he, and he, and he, he just trashed it. And at the time, a friend of mine at the time, and I'm thinking, I, I'm okay, and but I, I, I don't know. I've always liked this one. I was always happy with it. Oh yeah, it's awesome. I but mean, it, it, it was before also the hairspray technique, right? Yeah, so that was, that was all done with I think enamel. Well, I went over and airbrushed areas of white, I like Tamaya using Tamaya paint, a random camouflage over the thing, and then I, I blended it. Yeah, that, that I remember this now because this is how I painted that SU. I mean that uh, uh, JS one that was on the cover of the second issue of AFE Modeler. I went over it. I, I put on a a random coat using Tamaya matte white, and then blended it all using um, uh, thinned uh, humbral enamels matte white. Yeah, that's how I did that. I, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a great piece, and I certainly loved it. You know, another one that stuck out to me was was this panther. Yeah, I mean, and the unique base you had on it. Well, that that's not one of my favorite ones. I was not happy with the camouflage. I was still learning how to use the airbrush, um, but I, I've heard a lot of people say that they do like it. And someone gave me the idea for that that you know that Soviet finish. He showed me a color plate and. Uh, I, I so I just ran with it, but yeah, I do. I think I still have that one downstairs too. I know I do. I'm pretty sure I do. And someone built me the base for it. And, uh, but that one was a learning experience. And another problem I had was when I started blending the oils on it. Um, I I realized like I couldn't. I think it was the red tones from the oils when I was adding filters and stuff. I couldn't get it to blend correctly. It, it was a uh, it was yeah that I learned a lot with that one, <laughs> but it, it, it's I do like it, I do like that to my kit and the black wheels and the Soviet star and all that. Oh yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. you. Know, another one, another T thirty four. Yeah, and I still have that one too. Um, yes, that one. That was for that diorama and that base that you see it on with all the brick and everything. Mm -hmm. That was just a big test bed for that diorama I was working on with a Spanish modeler, modeler Carlos Elias, mm -hmm. so make the brick look right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that one. That, that's always been a. I love that those T thirty fours with the, the what they call the mattress armor all over them. And I had the Aber set. Mm -hmm. They were too small, or they, maybe they were accurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were too small to be like, no, I want them bigger. So I just built them myself using copper sheet and um, 
Aber uh, screens and soldered them up, made my own. And the like the one on the back, uh, the rear of the hull there, I, I don't know if they actually had that on them or not because I never had a rear picture of that thing. But I just put it on just to add a little more detail to it. Uh, that yeah, I, that that was a special one for me. I liked that one. That was a fun one. That's when I was really just starting to get into the publishing. I was starting to get confident. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm glad you put that one up here. Oh, it's a classic. Thank you. Another classic. This is my favorite here. That one. Oh, <laughs> boy, long day in that time in my life. Uh, what were you going to say? I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was just going to say "Naked Desperation." Quite a title for it, too. Yeah, um, that was when I was first screwing around with the uh, steel finishes and you know using actual pieces of bringing home steel plates that I stole from the dumpster at one of the welding shows. I think it was like a trade school that I went to up 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 in Bangor, Maine, and I stole them from the dumpster out back and quickly threw them in the trunk and got out of there when I was leaving as quick as I could. And that one there, that was that crazy one where I rebuilt the whole upper hull to get those interlocking plates and then someone said well wow why don't you just uh scribe out those dovetails instead with the plates interlock and i'm like yeah why didn't i do that <laughs> so uh, oh, yeah that was, that was quite a, and that i don't i forget that turret i don't remember where i got it from but it was horrible and just the work i had to do to cover the, some of the air holes and again i was just getting into it so i didn't really know the techniques on working with like super glue and accelerator as a way to fill holes on um uh you know fill holes and resin pieces like that quickly but um i just the only th i remember that i i i remember the um in my opinion the only critique i have is the wheels on the side that are facing us in that picture, the suspension came out just a little low. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it looks much better on the opposite side. But, you know, all the chalk marks where the fenders were going to be and uh, that, yeah, that I, I think I, I've often thought of doing that one again and just seeing what I could do with it now mm -hmm. compared to what it looked, what I did back then. And just using acrylics to get steel tones instead of those paints you find out there with the metallic paint that have the, the little metallic pigments in them. Mm -hmm. I I saw people using that. I'm like, no, I, I don't think it looks – I don't think that's how it looked. And when I dropped this one, obviously, it went over pretty well. So I guess I did the right thing. Yeah, for sure. It, I, I still am in awe of it. I love the blue tones on it. Yeah, that like gray. Yeah, it's a nice one. And I think your dust effects with the welds too is just something that just wasn't seen back then. It yeah, really blew it out of the water. Right. I don't think they would have chipped the slag off those welds, and I think they would have left the slag and the dust. Them, but but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So now I just paint them silver. Yeah. So here's here's a classic of yours, Adam, and and maybe before you really delved into color modulation, is that right? Yeah, um, that one, uh, that was a conversion that I did for Make Productions. Productions, I scratch built that turret, uh, of course, using some parts from the trumpeter kit, I think it was. And um, yeah, it had a, they made resin castings for me, and I use a resin casting for the box art. You know, Abra fenders and. I, you know, the weather on that one, I, I could have done a heck of a lot more with it at the time, I think. But it, I'm still, uh, I think I still have this one. I just, I, I wasn't sure about, you get that real dark weathering on the running gear, and I should have put some of that on the upper hull, too, to break it up. And I didn't, I didn't mm -hmm. think, that. I think it was in my earlier days. I think some of those dark tones would have really helped with that upper hull. Oh yeah, I, it's still it's still great. That it's like that lime green. It, I don't even know what you would consider. Yeah, people are calling the pea green Soviet. <laughs> I, I, know I just thought the 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 four bo cream mm -hmm. at the time. Some of the colors out there before we all started lightening them and that, lighting them up and everything, and then using the gradients color modulation. I just thought it was kind of a dead color, so I'll, I'll add a little bit of, uh, I'll add a little more yellow to it and see what mm -hmm. that does, see what people say. And then other people started doing it too, so I'm like, all right, yeah, good. 
Yeah. But I wouldn't paint it like that tone now. Yeah. I, don't, I would. No. So this next one, the Tiger P, I, I just remember seeing this. And again, another one that stuck out to me is y you're bringing so many different techniques into modeling at this time where if you look, I, I, and you could look at other ones. Like if I finished a model at this time, it'd be wash, dry brush, flat oh, coat, yes. where here you have so much tone, so much different textures, and then the chip Zimmerit is awesome as well. Yes. Well, I, I, that Zimmerit, that's all. I did that myself using um, a two-part epoxy. Mm -hmm. and the, the, this one here, I, that's like I used the rubber band tracks too on this one. Yeah, and yeah the, the Zimmerit, uh, I remember doing the chipping on that. There was, I guess to the kit to do that, what's that, the 003 one? That, yep. Uh, now there was a large hatch on. I don't now. I remember it was on the back of the kit that I put on there, where it wasn't there act, actually, or if it I didn't put it. Yeah, not, or I did put it on the kit and it was supposed to be there, and, and mm -hmm. I, I got some flack for that. But th there was something wrong with the kit and the hatch, and I just missed it. I just mm -hmm. built it from the box, and then like the screen on the back where those large vents are, on the. Rear of the hull, I had you had to scratch build those because the ones in the kit just didn't look right. And that was that was the last model I did before I moved to Spain. That was the last model I did here at home. Wow. So can you, you know, we'll 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 stop sharing for a second. Can you just talk about that, you know, trip to Spain and and how and how it all started? You know what you um, know, what, what what caused you to go to Spain? Well, it was. Um, I went over there to visit Miggy Jimenez and Luciano Rodriguez, uh, you know, George Lopez, mostly Miggy Jimenez, but I met them through him. And when I, when I first got there, um, like living here in America, I had no interest in moving to a large city. I lived in Portland, Maine. But that's a rather small city. And But when I got to Spain, I was just, I was impressed with how modern it was. And I knew, uh, did you guys lose me? Nope. No, no, you're there. Nope. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I was just impressed how clean it was, how modern it was, how much I love Barcelona. The hobby shops just blew my mind, like Trudy Rubio. And I was thinking, this is, I got to be here, man. I got to <laughs> be here. So when Nick Productions got big enough and they hired me, to, they hired me and I moved over there. And it was, it was a great time. Um, I think I went over there a couple times before I finally moved there and it was just uh it was uh it was, it was you know i was younger and i could i could make that move and I, you know i wasn't engaged and i didn't own a house and i it was funny because when i i got to spain i really loved it i i figured i'd be there about five years and i ended up being there about five years to the week and that that wasn't though until after I um I moved there. It was like that following spring. I was out. I figured I'd probably be here about five years. You know, maybe more. I it was just a guess. It was about that long. And it was it was great. Some of the best times of my life. I had a great time. It was it was really nice. So when you were there, you were a full time model maker for them, both pattern work I and finishing that. stuff. I did everything. Um, I did everything from doing coming up with new masters. I did painting a lot of stuff for the box art. Everything we did was in English, so I had to. I typed all the descriptions for the products, or most of them. And from what I remember, I would have if they needed help. I would package stuff if they needed help. I, I, would, I was everywhere they needed help. I, I didn't, you know, I never, I didn't care. Wherever you, you know, I designed the photo etch. I did everything, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. It was. I mean, I just remember that first winter. I was it was freaking cold. Because <laughs> 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 we were in the north, and um, we were close to the border of France. We were in Navarra, and it was like one morning it was really cold. The resin wasn't casting properly, so I put like a, an interesting spin on everything. And my roommate were I worked with my roommate a lot, Francois, and uh, um, it was you know it was. Yeah, exciting. Good time. Do you think That's it me. contributed to your to your modeling, kind of moving to a new locale and really focusing on your modeling, or you know, how do you think it affected you? 
Uh, I think it made a big difference because, you know, you, you go over there and you learn all these new techniques from these European modelers. And, and believe me, I was getting good, but like that stuff you all just showed, the, the early stuff, I still had a lot to learn. It was, it's obvious. And um, a lot of it was, you, you know, you, we were all pretty good at that company. Everyone was good at what they did. Everyone had good ideas. And I think that I, you know, I was to a point where I had so much ideas or I want, you know, I was so confident at, it, at that point at modeling that I would, um, you know, you work all day there and I'd go home, go home at night and work on my own stuff. You know, at Panther F, I did that at home, you know, and I'd bring it into the company and we'd all discuss it and I'd bring it back home and keep going. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of other stuff I did from home while I was there too. So I was just 24 seven, that's all I did. And I think that when you're doing it so much, it's gonna come to a point where it pops and you gotta kinda, you just kinda, you, you, or you get a little burnt out with it. And that's when I did that pants four, that pants four H. It was during that one where it's like, whoa, I gotta, I gotta stop this. And, it's just you know, I live in a beautiful part of the world. I need to be out more, and um, I ended up getting a flat in town. I met some people there. People lived in the town. I met them when I was uh, lifting at the gym. That was when you know I just met new people that kind of took me outside of modeling, and, and that was one thing Meg said a lot to me. He goes, you need to kind of back off from the modeling a bit and meet other people here. And, you know, I wasn't even really taking the time to learn the language. I was just so into the modeling. And it wasn't until I started hanging out with people in the bars, people I knew in the street, and hanging out with people on the weekend at their houses with, you know, their families and stuff that it started to click a bit the language. And it just got me away from, you know, modeling all the time. Because modeling with me, it's kind of come and gone. Like when I finished those books for FB Modeler, it was like, you know, I was burnt out. I, I didn't do it for a while. And, uh, and then even after that, I'm like, okay, what do I do now? I kind of lost my footing. And, you know, it took me a few years till I did that tortoise a couple, three, two years later that I started feeling confident again. Uh, but back to uh, Europe, um, Spain, you know, I, I've been to some of the part of Spain I was living in. I've been to like national parks, parks here in America, like Yosemite, for example. And I saw stuff out there just walking around where I lived that rivaled anything I saw in the national parks. And no one seemed to know about it, which was odd. I'm like, how come more Americans don't know about what's over here? These, these, you know, walking down trails that were built by the Romans that are still functioning, bridges that are still standing that no one knows about, you know? Because uh, you see people, they bike across them. And where I was, it was all vineyards. It was just, it was really awesome. Oh, Moscow, Idaho. Okay, I was going to say. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got Moscow, Maine, too. <laughs> yeah, so Adam, you know, bringing up Moscow, you know, well, let's just riff off of that. Where right. did you go to Moscow, and, and you know, what took you there? And, and what? Um, basically, Moscow was a time a uh, guy, he was a distributor for Make Productions, and, you know, he invited Miguel and I over there at the same time. I don't think Miguel went, it was just me. I forgot why he didn't go. And, um, at the time, it was kind of, there was some things going on at Make Productions. There was problems there with people running it. And it, I had, I think he was the first one I, I spoke to. I said, I'm thinking about moving back to the States. And, um, I think I'm, I think it's just time to go home. And I think I've gone as far as I'm going to go here. And, um, you know, so, you know, eventually he just, he tried to, you know, for a while, like a year, he had asked me to, you know, come over to Moscow, I'll put up the money, you know, I'll, I'll all you got to do, he says, I'll, make, I'll put the whole thing together. All you got to do is just build the models. You know, I'll even, you know, I even had a place to live and, uh, and that, that was, an, that was quite a trip because that, that's I one I had a lot more flexibility to come back to the states whenever I wanted. So I was kind of between here and there quite a bit. And 
that was when I did like some of my best work, I thought, because I, I didn't have time limits. I could do whatever I wanted. You know, I was by myself. It was quiet. And the um, Russia was, it's an acquired taste. It took me a bit to get you. It's like, you know, it took me a bit to get used to it. But once I started meeting people there and, you know, taking walks around the Kremlin on the weekend, and uh, then you find there's a whole nightlife there too in moscow mm -hmm. anything i saw in any other city i've been to and I, I, that ended up being quite a quite a trip too and once that was going i'm like okay i'm i want to move back to the states i was in my early 40s and um I, I just, again modeling it, it was fun for me but I just kind of wanted other things in my life. Mm -hmm. and, you know, then my t old teacher approached me about this teaching position and the money was better than I thought it would be. And I'm like, well, great. We got this company going. I'll do the modeling on the side. And, uh, you know, I'll, it, it's funny when you're, when, you, when I was trying to get into the, you know, I looked at people like Meg and other ones and I envied the fact that they were doing modeling full time. But after a few years being into it, I started looking at people like Alex Clark mm -hmm. and some of the others who had decent professional jobs, mm -hmm. did the modeling on the side and did whatever they wanted and had fun with it. I started admiring them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went full circle. I said, that's kind of what I wanted to do. So, um, you know, I thought I was hoping, you know, the guy who I worked with over there would do a little more with it with Wilder, and I, I don't want to get into it too much. Um, he did pass away. Mm. That was really hard. And uh, although I didn't agree with everything he did, he was a, a good friend of mine. You know, and I, I would, even after I left the company, before he died, I said, you can have it, just do what you want with it. I still, would, I still supported him, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so I, uh, it was, it was an interesting time, but I think things turned out okay. I'm happy with what I do now. I mean, teaching stressful, but you may get a lot of time off. I got all summer to build models, do what I want, hang out the house, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I'll yeah, yeah. Find it, finding that balance has been good for you, you think? Yeah, and it's funny because at different types, that's an interesting point you bring up because at different types of your different times of your life, yeah, you need more of it. And as I've gotten older, there's just other things that, and I, I'll never be, you know, I'll never be like night shift getting new stuff up every week. I'll never be like that anymore. Uh, and I just, but it gives me time to focus on the stuff I'm doing. And although I don't drop stuff as much, I hope people still like what I drop when I drop it. Yeah, I think uh, probably not much danger of that not happening. <laughs> Howdy. Uh, <laughs> shout, shout out to Darren of the Model Geek. So, sorry, Adam, go no, ahead. No, it's okay. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, like I was just saying, yeah, not much chance that people aren't going to like what you drop. Uh, SU-101 is a great example. Yeah, well, it's funny. Like now with Instagram and stuff, you can put stuff up. And, and the stuff I really like that I do that I'm happy with, doesn't seem to get quite as much traffic as some of the other stuff I've done. Uh, you know, like the German stuff always seems to get a lot more attention, and which um, than than some of the Soviet stuff does because you know you, more people have Tiger One kits than they do SU One Hundred One kits, and there's yeah. a lot more photographs of tigers and out in the um, you know in combat than SU One Hundred Ones. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I love I love the SU one oh one, it's that's that's probably one model I'm not gonna sell. Yeah, for sure. Does it do you think it helps your work that you know we're kind of in this golden age of modeling where there's so many tanks and vehicles now that before if there even was a kit it was it might have been like a garage kit, not great quality. Does it does that help kind of fuel your your desire to build more armor kits? Well, I only have so much time, so uh, I have to kind of be careful what I choose. But he, he, oh, yes, I do. Um, uh, I, you know, back before we had all these kits, you could find these kits of resin. But there was that joke that went around between modelers was that um, 
you know, you buy the expensive full resin kit so you can take dimensions off from the scratch build your own. <laughs> you know, like that bear yeah. I did for you connect your models when I got that. Um, it was given to me by, by a friend of mine. And um, I, I was so psyched. I thought, man, this thing's a monster. And then when I saw it, I like, well, it's a little rough. It wasn't like the other kits I've had. And I had some very good kits from them. So I just scratch built it. Just took the dimensions off of it, used the parts I could. But it gave me the opportunity, too, to put my own spin on it. I, but I, think, I think it went off on a tangent. What was your initial <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. All those kids that are out there now, and does that inspire me? Sure, it does. Like, uh, I wanted to, yes, you want one. I wanted to do the one with the, the 122 mounted on it. But, you know, I couldn't, they didn't have a kit for that. And I, you know, I even bought the Able one to see if I could somehow fit on the mailet, but it didn't fit. And I, I didn't have enough information on the mailet to sit there and comfortably scratch build it. And then about, you know, and I started building this, and this is a whole nother conversation we can get into, but you know, I started building this, and I was watching, uh, what was that, Escape from New York, that old Kurt Russell flick, <laughs> the Carpenter flick, right, with Kurt Russell? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I was sitting there, Carpenter. yeah, I was, I'm doing like a retro movie night about four or five years ago, I was just sitting in front of the computer, you know, with some cocktails, and, uh, you know, I need something to do, so I just took that out and started put, putting it together after I saw the one from the model that we were talking about earlier, and you know, the fun stuff, making the weld seams, the texturing, uh, adding the stuff that wasn't in the kit, the dovetails between where the plates interlock and everything. And uh, um, where the heck was I going? <laughs> <laughs> um, remind me. So, so, oh, I'm the yes. Yes, I'm sorry. So um, anyway, I didn't build this kit for a number of years. And then about two months ago, my um, my uh, fiance and I, she wanted to go to a mall in New Hampshire, so I creeped over to uh, a store across the street in New Hampshire called the Hobby Emporium. It's a really cool store. Um, they've been there since they've, I've been going there since I was like 22 years old, and there's the, some of the same dudes still working there. <laughs> so I walked in there, and uh, I'm just looking at all the stuff because I can't keep up with what's coming out anymore. I like to the time to surf the modeling sites like I used to, and then what they got one they came out with a kit with that one point two mounted on. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch, you know. But because this one was all done, but hey, what the heck? But yeah, you're right. Everything's out there. Everything, everything, you know. Uh, all right. Uh. Okay, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Tim uh, Tim Cavalier wants to know uh, regarding German builds getting more traction. Do you think it's manufacturers or individual models that drives that? You know, it's funny because and that's an interesting question, Tim. And thanks for that question. Um, I always thought now with the era we're living in, you know, with the Syrian conflict and some of the other stuff going on that you would possess even more modern stuff, but not really. You're still seeing a lot of German stuff, the old stuff that I, I kind of came up on, the Tigers and Panzer IVs and T-34s and Shermans. That still seems to stay in the mainstream from where I'm looking at. So... I don't know. It might be the history. Yes, it could be the kits. The kits are, like, are really beautiful now. Uh, with me personally, like I'm doing more German now just because that's what generates more interest on my Instagram account. You know, I'm not going to lie about that, but too, I do enjoy it. You know, like the C100, it's, it's big, okay, but it's big and square. It's going to be a heck of a lot easier to paint than that SU-101 was, man. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a combination of the kits. I think it's the history and people like me who just want more people on their Instagram account. Again. <laughs> <laughs> There's no shame in that. <laughs> yeah, I'm really shameful for saying it. <laughs> anyway. So, Adam, yeah. with that E100, are you going to do the giant slabs on the side of the hull or are you thinking you're going to do it clean? Um, no, put slabs on, sure. Okay. I got an idea with those. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yes, I will. But yeah, that, that's another one that started one night in front of um, um, is, is that the same Big John was doing the Sherman that did the Big John Sherman project book thing a while back. I haven't spoken in a while. Hey, jo um, that is John Hale. Yeah, yeah, John Hale. That's the guy's name. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Um. On the E100 or 
Yeah, the E100. Yeah, I'll, I'll put those slabs on the side. And um, I just, it's just a big thing that I can paint. I don't have to worry about details, you know, obstructing rain marks and stuff like that. And all, all that, that was just one of those things I started putting together when I was watching, I was watching a, like a history on, you know, the war in Japan or something from a Japanese perspective and just just needed some because when you like usually on like Saturdays I'm up at six in the morning you know I, I, I make breakfast pour a big cup of coffee and I'm either working with photo etcher all day or I'm painting all day because Catherine works uh, Tuesday through Saturday so it gives me Saturdays here alone so uh, but by the time the evening comes along and I just want to wind down, I want to watch something on YouTube after her and I have dinner or something. And I don't have it in me to get back into the photo etch or get into the chip. And so I thought I'll pull a kid out of the dash and start putting it together, dry fitting it and doing all that stuff. And that's how that started. I, I, I've had it. And, uh, yeah, that, that's how most of my kids start, actually. That's how most of my kids start, is just putting them together because and I'm not a fan of shelf queens. I only have two. Lucky you. <laughs> yeah. well, man, we'll be done soon. <laughs> so, so, so uh, go ahead, John. I was just going to, I was just going to say, Adam, we had a few questions from our listeners uh, that wrote in a little bit before the show. Sure. And one of them, Martin Drayden, he asked, Adam, do you have in your mind exactly what you're going to do with every step of the build? Or do you tend to let the build lead you into fresh ideas and directions? Both. Both. Okay. Great question. Uh, the, like that E100 turret I showed you guys before we got started on this. Um, that was just, again, I got the texture and done on it. And I, I, I got all these other details and the weld seams. Everything was done. So I'm looking at, okay, well, what else can I do to this? Because I don't feel like starting the haul. And I still got a, another 45 minutes for I, before this movie ends. So what else can I do? So I'll start putting different stuff on it that way. You know, texture and different parts that I initially wasn't going to texture. Or, oh, okay, let's put some casting numbers on these parts. And, you know, where that's the theoretical armor, you can do that. That's why I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. And where it's German, it's still going to be kind of popular, you know, <laughs> more so than it was something <laughs> Soviet. Um, it's a, a guy on, um, check this guy out on Instagram. His name is, um, I think it's Soviet Bear Models. It's, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. He yeah. finished a, um, an IS-6. And he didn't get a lot of um, he didn't get a lot of um, attention with it. And I'm sitting there looking at it like this is just as good as anything I could have scratch build. And how come he's not getting more with this? And I remember you know like wow, this is that's a, one of the best scratch build Soviet subjects I've ever seen. It's just fabulous, you know. And I think I want to uh, try. Uh, I know TJ, is that Daniel? That, yeah, that's Daniel. Daniel Brooker. Brooker. Yep. Yeah, Brooker. yeah, that, um, unbelievable modeler. Yes, yeah. he did that real cool Sherman too with all the welded plates on it. And I'm looking at that stuff like, man, I wish I, you know, that's like, you know, I wish I had just a little more time to maybe do some scratch building like that because that's a, you know, stuff like that is is interesting with a Sherman. You can't go wrong, you know. Even a prototype like that, you're not going to go wrong with that. So. But that, yeah, that's some good scratch building. So uh, Bob Bear, the voice of Bob, how you doing, Bob? He wants to know, Adam, is there such a thing as too much weathering? Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's right. I mean, um, the the one I'm doing now, I, I, I remember, like, uh, the I, the one I finished before it, the uh, that um, that SE one fifty two. I'm sorry, it's late. I'm a little tired. That uh, that what is the object? Um, it's the one there. It's the um, they can also they also call it the SE one fifty two M forty five. Want the huge um, with the huge gun on it. Um, that one there, I really weathered it, and I wasn't shy with the weathering in the mud, but. When I started on this SU 101, I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to keep this much lighter. I just for just just to give something different for me. And I remember that the whole thing of going through. Now be careful with the weather. Now be easy with the weather. 
Take it easy. Oh, did I would do it this time. And no, it came out. I think when you're a little scared, because I didn't, I don't, I don't want all my stuff to look the same. So, um, no, there is such thing as too much weathering because it can, if you're doing things like color modulation, you can cover it up too much. So, of course, you just have to. What I've found is um, if you try to be too restrained, it will almost come out looking just right. So don't be afraid because there's so many weathering steps I do in layers. You got dust tones and thick, dry earth tones, and then you got the, the, the wet mud, and you're building up all these layers, and what can come out or start as what you think is light weathering when you're done, it's not. you got a lot of earth tones on there, so you got you got to really – um, you got to really take it easy because if you're building up all those earth tones, sure, you can, you can, um, overdo it a little bit. Yes. Good question, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Really good question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I guess going back to your shelf queen comment earlier, Adam, you know, Pete Kokla, a good friend of ours, he writes in. You know, what do you do when you get burnt out on a project? Do you sell? Do you shelve it? Do you power through it, or do you just move on to something else? Power through it because yeah. my time is limited. You know, I put months into putting something together. I, I um, it's not just not worth my time to start on something new. For example, I did a Chinese um, howitzer with a um, it had a digital camo on it. Mm-hmm. And I got started getting to that. I remember just sitting like, oh, my God, what have I done trying to mass this on there? Mm -hmm. And I, that took me, you know, that took me a long time. And that was, you know, I'd lost interest in the subject a bit, even though I do like Chinese armor very much. Um, I just, for some reason, I think it was just I got overwhelmed with that. Um, I got overwhelmed with that, all the masking on that finish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back and forth to fix overspray. And uh, I, I finally got done. It came out. I put it on Instagram and I put it on um, Facebook. It seemed to go over pretty good. But I remember a guy, my graphic designer, a good friend of mine, he's like, Adam, don't put yourself in that situation. Can you do something Chinese? Just do some single camouflage. Would you? You'd just be so much happier. And so the Chinese subject I did after that was, yeah, just had a sand coat over it. I had a moment mm -hmm. with that one. That, I like that one. <laughs> couple, couple of uh, questions for you, Adam. Uh, Jackson Stanton wants to um, ask for advice on depicting a newer clean vehicle. A lot of the visual interest we add to models comes in the form of weathering. I've always struggled with weathering a non-weathered subject. Yeah, I, I yeah I know what he's. That's actually not a bad question. So like something modern maybe that's kept pretty well. Um, there was a uh, there was a PLZ that I did. Yeah, and going back to that Chinese modern vehicles, uh, it was a kit that Meng did, and they sent me the prototype of the kit to put together for them. And that one there, the picture, of course, it was another one with a nice digital finish, but it wasn't going there that time. So I found one that they were just they were on trials or something, and they were they had a sand finish on. They're pretty clean, but what I did was. Um, and this is a great question. I went heavy with the washes, heavy with the shading, and there was like these those what are those those? It's like these. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry for my lack of um, terminology here for the parts of these vehicles. Those rubber flaps on the side that protect the road wheels. What would you call those? Like the skirts. I yeah. call them the skirts. All right, let's call them that. Um, you know, I put a lot of the chip uh the paint chipped off or a lot of the rubber showing i um, mean you could do that in a way where it, it emphasizes each each or yet contrast skirts um, i'd have to see a picture of it i forget what else i did to that thing you know putting a little blue flag on it keeping the weathering extremely light um and adding some other you know like exhaust runs and other things like that and when i bring that to a show that's one of the ones i spent the less least time weathering and relying more on washes 
just to emphasize a vehicle, the model, where if I put it on a table, everyone will look at it, and that's the one they like. That's the one my fiance likes the most. She likes that better than my tortoise. Yeah. You know, Maybe it's it's, <laughs> it's like the mayday mayday vehicles in Moscow, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that would be real tough, but you could do it. I mean, again, just focus on the washes and use that to bring out the different details. I, I wish we had a photo of that that PLZ we could put up. I don't know if I, if I have the power to do it from where I'm sitting. Probably not. Um, but anyway. Um, there's someone asking, would I ever do 148th? Yeah, Luke Pitt. Yep. Yeah, and um, I did. We did a lot of 48th scale stuff to make productions because it's smaller and took less time, and would allow us to get the products out on time. Uh, I once I got into it, and I was painting and everything. Yeah, I, I did like it, but I never. I always just enjoy 135th. It's a little bigger. And I can detail it a little more with the fine painting. But I've seen guys who do 148 that do some incredible stuff. I mean, you can, there's a lot you can do with it. Don't get it wrong. It's just, I guess the way I can answer it is it's not really my um, forte. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of 148 stuff out there that's really interesting, really well done. Yeah, Luke's a great example of that. He's a great 48 scale armor modeler. Uh I think I've seen his name before. Um, I'd have, maybe I've spoken to him. I'd have to, I'll look, I'll look him up after this. Was it Luke Pitt? Yeah. I know, I know I've talked to him, spoken to him. I know I have. Yeah, Aaron Cook Armor, our buddy, he's a great 48 scale modeler. And Pat Johnston is amazing, does really, really great quarter yeah. scale armor. Yes. Oh my God. That guy's, yeah, he is, he's been, yeah, I've been following his work for a number of years. I remember back about back during the MIG Productions days, like I would drop something like, "Oh man, mm -hmm. I don't know if I can do that in thirty fifth. So, yes. You know, another question that we got in, and it, and it kind of goes very similar um, to a question I asked before. But you know, how much of a plan is involved in getting the finish? Um, that you want versus how much is done on the fly and just working towards that reference or, or that shot in your mind when, you, when you're going through the weathering process. And that's, that was asked by our friend Chris McLean. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, a lot. Yeah. I, like, again, with this last one, I tried to keep the light all the way through. And you kind of want what details do I not want to cover up with the weathering? What places are the chipping done really well? You want to keep it light. Um, I have an idea kind of as I'm going through it. But again, there's so many different parts and details on these models. that I have their own chip in and all their different effects. That kind of dictates where you put the earth tone. But in the end, you have that overall look. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, you know, the... For a while, I was getting when I was learning all these kind of these all these new um, weathering techniques, all these layers. I noticed I was overdoing it with the weathering. Again, I was just putting on too many layers, and it was building up and building up and building up. And I just uh, with the last model before this one, I just I just like okay, I gotta step back, step back, calm down, relax, and um, you know, just be a little more reserved. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ian saying, always on the fly for me. <laughs> hey, that's good. That's how you're having fun. Me cover up my stuff with weathering. Uh, have I done that? Probably have. But I usually, I've gotten pretty good where I don't need to as much as I used to. How about that? Can you take that? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, Adam, you know, now, now I'd love to go back to sharing my screen. Sure. And, speci and specifically call out some models that, you know, our listeners and some of us really liked. Mm -hmm. And I know we've been going a little bit over an hour, so if we can keep you a little longer, that'd be awesome. If everyone wants to stay and you guys aren't sick of me yet. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. I'm going to bring up this one first. Right. Um, oh, man. That was um, so awesome. <laughs> that was a big productions project. And I am drawing a blank on who came up with that master. Is it Fitchmare? 
Fictimire, yeah. Michael Fictimire from, from oh, Indus- that name, <laughs> Industrial Mechanica. <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah. I always called them that, too. You, I never, never knew I was pronouncing it that incorrectly. Um, yeah. Yeah, that one. Um, that was for that was one of the ones where I did for make production where um, I had all the time I needed to finish it. Um, mm-hmm. Like Meg wasn't there a lot. I, he was doing other stuff, and it was kind of just me there. And uh, um, we kind of came up with the idea together, um, have a modern look on the the actual walking part of it because that's a modern part. Have the KB look turret look like it was dragged out of a swamp. Mm-hmm. And that that one, I that that was one I tried the hairspray technique over the rust, and it just I just couldn't get it to work right. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, like a lot of the light greens you see on there, I painted by hand. Mm-hmm. And same with like the rust tones, I had to have washes on to get the you know the gun it's segmented into three mm-hmm. parts. You know, mm-hmm. I used green on the edge, and then the two rust tones would mm-hmm. that up. Then the twenty one that came out pretty well, mm-hmm. and. You then put on those big wet effects to break it up further. And that was what and when I got that part done. Like, yeah, okay, that worked. That that did a lot. And um, you know, the, the light blue fuel tank on the side. I, I just found some Soviet uh, Soviet uh, dry transfers. I don't even know where we got them. They might have been the old Nick Productions ones and uh, um, used those. Yeah, that was funny. When I put that on links, which is mostly an armor modeling site, I never thought that would get the response it did. I, I never thought that would. Uh, and yeah, it's watermark. What is that? 2003, it looks. Oh, yeah, nine. Three, three or nine. Yeah, I can't tell. Yeah. It looks oh, kind of nine. That's a, yeah. It or is. Or three. A, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's nine, 2009. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the weathering and the grease, and I, I, you know, I learned some new stuff with adding grease effects on when I did that model. And you know, when you're doing it every day, and you get so used to using these mediums, that's when you can start doing new things because you get so um, confident with it. And, I, and when you get to that point, you've done it so much, you feel like you can't go wrong. That's when you really have fun. That's when you come up with new stuff. That's you know, like when I came up with speckling and everything. That was just by accident because I was getting lazy of just putting on the little. Uh, like the speckling on the top of the turret there with the wet effects, you know, you're dabbing every little one on by brush and they all look the same. And finally I just got the heck with that. I just took the brush and put it with my fingers and then I just stopped. Like, whoa, <laughs> that looks cool. So that's where kind of that came from. It came from laziness and it's uh, one of my the techniques I use the most. I use it almost in every step. Yes. Uh, that, yes. I remember that. That was a great little, that was a fun little subject in the weather and the, the light earth tones look good over the green. And yeah, everyone, yeah, people still talk. I'm surprised everyone still talks about that one all the time. The, the wet effects are just, uh, I mean, it just sets it off. Yeah, I was happy with it. And you know, I, I'm sorry, what? You're, you're just fearless with those wet effects. I don't, I don't have it in me to do it. I, I'm always like, ah, no, that look terrible. No, yeah. but that's just from doing it a lot. And because you, you look at it after, you look at your stuff like, well, I could have went more with that. I could have went more with, more with it. But this one here, I, I, I just, you know, you're doing it every day. And I, I remember looking at it when I got home that night, I looked at some photos and said, yeah, I'm so glad I did that. I was, I was happy with the finish on that one. And uh, it was a clever little kit that um, uh, Thick Mare came up with. I see that, Mom. Yeah, and you did a, a Panzer 38T one as well. I don't have a picture yeah, that, of me, but Yeah, I like that one better with a flamethrower on the side. Mm-hmm. But that one just seems to be the more popular one that people keep bringing up. Yeah. Yeah. And Our then, buddy Ian Bonner wants to know if there's a technique or step that you dread when you're doing a model, something you have to do, but you really don't like oh, to do. Yeah, painting, painting markings on by hand. That's a great question, and that is stressful. I, you know, um, like this one here, this this E fifty. You know, I had all the dry transfers for those um, those those uh, German markings, but in the past, you know, you're using a white pencil. I, I you know, I'm spelling, realizing when I'm done, I spelled Soviet slogans incorrectly, so I go <laughs> back over it. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's it, it, that's the answer to your question. Painting markings on by hand. 
Yeah, this is another great one, Adam. This this has kind of surprised me. This was one of your first kind of modern builds in a long time, if I recall right. Yeah, the scale model attic. And I remember we, you know, I, I I've never I've never liked the M one one three. I always thought it was kind of boring. Even though as I time's gone on, I do I do like Vietnam era subjects, especially um, some of the um, uh, the American stuff that was there. But this one. Um, s someone came up with that slogan idea and asked me to do this for a, a magazine on uh, Vietnam era armor. And yeah, that one came out pretty good. What was he, what was good about that one was um, I had a book with a lot of colored photos in it. With a, so the I, I was able to get the earth tones looking pretty good. Uh, they look pretty accurate to me, but the big thing was I wanted to kind of make it about the figures. Yvonne Cocker painted those for me, and as I'm building this thing and waiting for them to send those figures back, I'm like, well, I just paid them for these. I hope the heck I can get them to fit on this thing and look natural, and they just did. It just worked. Mm -hmm. uh, it just worked, and those little pieces of uh, uh, angle iron on the side, I found one picture they put those on the side probably put a tarp over it or something to keep them uh shield them from the sun so i threw those on there uh and again i wasn't afraid with the wet effects i mean this is a top picture of that heavy wet effects on the roof it just worked yeah like if you zoom out on that a bit yeah with the mud tones and everything um it's hard to get mud tones to um or what earth tones to be at that glossy because um, a lot of the, the earth tones that you use are they're from matte. I think those are like matte enamel paint. So they're going it, to, it's real hard to give them this real glossy wet look, but for some reason on this one, it really came out. And the, all the, the Verlinden, um, you know, the boxes and the cooler. Yeah, and, the, and the contrast of the dried dirt left over from the water and then the wet, you know, the wet, muddy yeah. stuff is great. Sure. great. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, that, that stowage on there, that's an example of you're going to put stowage on a vehicle. Um, you got to make it look as weathered as the rest of the vehicle. And that was a mistake people used to make. Not as much anymore, though. I see a lot of people, they don't make that mistake anymore. They're weathering the stowage to it, and it all looks right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob wants to know after the build, what part of the process of painting, weathering, and distressing is your favorite? Um, probably the wet effects. That's when you can really start at breaking up parts, adding contrast. That, and I enjoy the chipping too. But man, that is a long process, and my eyesight isn't what it was. So, you know, you're under the optimizer all day, chipping a model all morning and all afternoon, and you know, Catherine comes home from work, I'm feeling more tired than on a regular day with the kids in the classroom, you know. Um, but I do enjoy it. Now, but probably getting to the final of weather and effects, you know, grease tones, wet effects, then you can really, that's when you can really add some different stuff and give, and if you, if you apply it properly and, you're not, in, and you know what you're doing, you can even give your model a, a bit of a different look, I think. You can make it stick out from other models that are finish in a similar way because a lot of us these days we're all using similar techniques got another question um adam you've talked in the past about letting the model talk to you do any of these finished models cry out to you for one more edition um Well, all right. The SU one on one, I'm working on that. I got an idea the other day. I'm going to add something on that. Um, I, I don't know. Usually, I, I don't. I devote so much time painting these things that if this if that's an idea or a detail I want to put on, I'll put it on. Because I've devoted that much time, I might as well go the full, you know, just because. Like, if I finish, like, at Sherman, who knows what I'm going to do another one? So give it everything you got. You know, and if it, if it prolongs yeah. putting something up there a couple of weeks, well, fine. It'll look that much better when you put it up. Ian's got a bunch of questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he usually does. Too divisive, but I'm a cat guy, big time. Love cats. <laughs> I got a great big cat. 
Is Ian, are you a are you a cat guy or a dog guy? He's both. He's both? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Catherine wants a dog. I'm like, all right, you you walk it. <laughs> <laughs> Cats is getting a litter box. Yep. <laughs> JB, you have some more questions? Yeah, I can throw up. Actually, uh, let me throw up another screen share. Sure. And I will specifically, really, it's one model that's stuck out for a while. And, and just walk us through maybe the the intensity it took to accomplish a finish like this. Oh, man, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Ian, by the way. Um, well, I don't know where I came up with that idea. <laughs> um, where did I come up with that? This one, all right, this goes back to the question someone asked earlier about do you ever feel there's something you need to add when you're done? This was um, this was a one where I was. This was the first one I did after the not the first one, but the first one after I finished those two books. That I was kind of getting back in. I was kind of finding myself again. I was starting to feel confident again. And I I didn't set a time limit on this. I took all the time on this I could. And this is another one that I will never sell. And uh, I, some of it, like with the impacts, I had to kind of guess as to the effects they might leave. But just getting those scratches around, you know, from the fragments in the paint, and then going over the white with the lighter whites, and then the greens with the lighter greens, and then adding the you know the browns for the the steel, and you know, uh, it um, it took me months. But I enjoyed every minute of it, and I have no regrets. And this is probably, I'd go as far as saying, it's probably my one of my all-time personal favorites that I've done. And I, again, I'll never sell it. And I just love the subject. And it was basically taking that one out of the box and saying, um, what am I going to do with this? And it took me a long time to... Um, and I think part of the reason I added all those impacts was, again, just to give it something a little different. And uh, the figures on it kind of made it up as I went. At first, it only had, like, three figures. And I'm like, you know what? I want to put two more on. No, I had four initially. I want to put two more on or one more on. So I had Yvonne paint me up another figure. And I want to do another one like this. Um, some, I love these wacky, I mean, dark green is such a great color to weather and, um, yeah, that, it, it was that, getting back to those scratches, it was like, I'd get it done and then I'd look at it again and I'd pull out the paints, mix the light green colors again and go back over it again. And then I'd go back over it again. Then I'd add more whites. And then that one was just looking at it, doing it some more, taking test photos, blowing up the photos on your screen, looking at them. Because if you think about it, most people are going to view your stuff on a computer screen. It's going to be blown up right in their face with high-res photos. So that's what, how I that's how I critique my work. And, um, you know, going back over it again, going back over it again. And, uh, yeah, that was... Um, that took some time, but I'm happy I did it. And I still, I still love looking at photos of this vehicle. I think, hey, I did that, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, it tells a story. I mean, what I love is just the, the effects on the uh, the machine gun mount here and the other splashed effects of of the rounds. It's just, it's just incredible. Such imagination. Thank you, and that thank you very much. And that was where you know, like the lighter. Uh, sheet metal parts in there, like the visor over the periscope and the fenders. Mm -hmm. uh, I chipped those with a, uh, more of a blue steel tone to try to break the chipping apart that way. I didn't, I didn't pull any punches on on this one. No, uh, it's it's next level. It's beautiful, beautiful kit. It really is. <laughs> yeah, that's, thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you put that photo up there. I'm glad you like it. Darren yeah, Cook wants to know how the how the hell you made such realistic impact marks. Uh, take a soldering iron, just a soldering iron. But you know, there's people doing other stuff out there with putty to help add. 
I didn't use any putty or anything. Like someone will, they'll put a hole in it, then they'll they'll take putty, put it inside the hole, and they push something like a pencil or something in the hole. And you see that putty effect come out. And I didn't do that with this one. I, the whole thing was done with a soldering iron, and then um, I took the knife, a hobby knife, and I I cut out I cut out the um, the parts of the impacts where the plastic didn't look right. And then I took that same hop, hop that, I'm sorry, that same, um, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, soldering iron, I'm sorry, I took it to work. We have a bench grinder there. I, I made it to a real fine, fine point. And that's where I got some of those, you know, the small, small impacts where the um, parts of the steel flew off and put in smaller impacts. <laughs> In, um, or small little dents in the plate. So uh, that's all done with a soldering iron. First a dull one, then I sharpened it up and put on the fine little holes and and then, yeah, painted over it. The hard part, though, was trying to figure out what it would do to that, the um, the sheet metal. Um, you know, like the fenders there. Was, you know, how would that affect those and trying to make those look damaged through other little pieces? That was actually a lot of fun, though. And if you can see on the side there, there are pieces that mount the tracks, and you can see the remnants of them kind of sitting there, all bent up. And that, that's where I really just have fun with this. This that's why I wanted to make it a hobby again, so I could just do whatever I want and not worry about time restraints. Um, yeah, that that it's, it's stuff like this. This is why I really got into modeling tanks. One thirty fifth is is just stuff like that. Yeah, it's stellar. You know, another one that sticks out is your latest work, and just that the one, yeah, the last finish out last summer. Um, that was one there. We we're talking about the, the weathering. Um, you know, you got to be careful because you can build it up a little bit too much. And I wanted this to be weathered very much from the beginning anyway, so I wasn't too worried. That's why when I did the SU one hundred one, I I held it back because I wanted it to look different than this one. Mm -hmm. And this one here took a long time too because you know you get the brick all over, all the stowage on the back, those mouse tracks on the front. But what were this one where I ran into problems with it was the camouflage is a little complex, and I found it that it was difficult to break up the model after with the earth tones and the washes and everything because the camouflage was breaking up the earth tones and the washes too. If that makes any sense, mm -hmm. um, so. Um, if you're going to do complex camouflages, just be careful. Um, I, I in, Because this, this is one of my favorite subjects. This is another Soviet prototype. And mm -hmm. I crawled all over this thing at Kubinka. And it, it's just, it's, if I could steal one tank and put it in my backyard, it'd probably be this one. Mm -hmm. And... Um, part of me, though, is with all the detail I put on, I, I, there's a part of me inside that wishes I didn't put so much of this extra detail all over it because I just like the way the vehicle looks. I like the overall shape of it. Yeah. You know, it's such an awesome-looking self-help gun, you know, or tank destroyer. Yeah, um, you know, through model tracks. But um, it, it, it's still, though, the, you know, like the hardest part was all that the the, the – that mattress, the bed spring armor, they call it on the side. Well, that, like, getting all that and all those things mm. and everything. Yeah, that, that was fun, too. But, again, you know, the bricks, those tarps you see under there, that was yeah. – are you, we talked about that earlier. I had that envisioned when I started, okay? And I had, like, brick that would fall behind that armor and everything. But it just took a long time to paint. And that took a, a good part of the beginning of last summer. I'd get up, take a walk, come home. I was working on that and – you know, with the audio books on YouTube and, uh, uh, and yeah, and then just painting every just the screening on there and trying to make it look like rusted steel, and but yet yeah, trying to break it up at the same time. Mm -hmm. you can't skimp on any of it if you if you want to do it right. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that was a project, but that that was a lot of fun too, and I got to be really creative with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I remember when you were painting it and you had a picture of it without any of this stuff on it. Yeah. Yes. And it was the, the, the turquoise and the, you know, all of the colors. It was like, whoa. 
and then yes. what you've transformed it into is unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of bra a lot of uh, copper sheet on that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think what I did was I hand painted that over hair over the hairspray, mm -hmm. and I chipped it. Uh, so you can, if you're quick, you can hand paint over over hairspray once you've applied it. Hmm. But again, if you took all that stuff off, that model still by itself, just the shape of it looks cool too. Yeah. So uh, sometimes I wish I didn't do all that work, but sometimes I like it. It just depends on the mood I'm in that day. No, it certainly adds to it. And yeah, yes. Here's the uh, Chinese SPG that you were talking about. That's, that was one someone asked me earlier, did I ever get in the middle of a project? And ran into a block and like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. That, that was this one. Mm -hmm. But I like the way it came out. I, I think the, you know, and here's the thing. I wanted to just challenge myself to a digital camouflage and a mm -hmm. complex one of that, just so I have it in my display case. But I don't have it in my display case. And I forgot where this one went. Mm -hmm. I forgot. Um, yeah, it's it's great. I love the digital scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a great kit. And it's a really cool. You know, the Chinese armor is, is really interesting. You know, it's it it looks Soviet, but it's not. And it, it they use these really cool camouflages. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, China, Chinese are they're interesting people. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, that that was a. I finally got it done. You know, I added some snow on the running gear from a reference photo I saw. And that was a nice one to get done. I mean, I was glad to have it, but boy, that was some work. Jonathan Anderson, our buddy Scale Model Doc, wants to know how many tape trees died for this build? <laughs> oh, my God. No, actually, there were stencils that I got, and I forgot who the manufacturer was. And I, I just found them by accident one day when I was researching this thing. And thank God, because I don't know how I would have done that um, otherwise, but I was going to try. And I had a, David Parker send me this model. And, and when the guy found out who I was, he sent me a couple extras too. So having those extra sets allowed me to mm – -hmm you know, break them apart and put them with, thank God he did that. I wasn't even smart enough to ask him for a couple. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, oh man, just a mask. And since some of that stuff too, I couldn't mask around the details. So I just had to airbrush and then go back and paint it by brush. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of cussing on that one. A lot of, oh my God, <laughs> what did I get myself into it at the same time? I promised an article and blah, blah, blah. There's the one we were talking about this yeah. one. Someone was asking, keeping the weathering to a bare minimum. Um, you can see the toolboxes, the the uh, the that blocked armor at the front. I'm not sure how that works, but using the watches to bring that out, and you know, even having some of the green under the sand, but keeping it really light. Mm -hmm. I had a much a much more enjoyable time with this one. And yeah, this is one I bring everywhere, and people like it. And I still have it, but. That's an example of keeping the weather in real light and just relying on techniques, placing them carefully, and you can still turn something and take something and, and make it really interesting. You don't have to go overboard on the weathering too much. And mm -hmm. Display the vehicle. And that, yeah, that, that was one of keeping it really light. Mark, that. Mark Bradley wants to know what your most challenging build to date was. Uh, let me think. Probably that bear that I did, that was completely scratch built. But I, it actually, I was I was um, living in Russia. I was modeling all day long. So I built it in conjunction with some other projects. You know, I built so much because it was a series of scratch built articles that I did. So I'm like, well, I can scratch build and show how to do this this week, next week, next month. I'll worry on about this part. Next month, I'll worry about that part. It was the most complex, but it wasn't. That, that tortoise was a tough one. That getting all the fenders and the rear toolboxes all rebuilt and all the measurements that was that was tough. Um, another one that that um, SU one fifty two forty five that you put up a few photos ago that was that was a tough one too. Getting that 
standoff armor on there? That's a good question. Yeah. With that, yeah, that's an awesome build. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's another one. That was another one I got into, and I'm like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> about this one. That was built pretty much from the box. I think it had some photo etch on the inside. And that was another one. When it came out, I was glad that I did it. But boy, every single piece of that thing was a, a like a, you know, you had to figure out how to paint it differently. I had folders and folders of and folders of images I found on the web of painted steel plates just to try to make them all look different. And just in talking about someone asked me what I hate doing the most, though painting those texts on the side there, that you know that those Soviet. Um, the lettering on there that was a that was a tough afternoon a lot of swearing <laughs> yeah but it looks okay thank god um yeah that, that i remember that that was quite a that was a major project yeah that one too huh um oh, i love the blue modulation me too that's one of my favorite ones with color modulation that was that i, I really like that one too and that was when i started using the gradient starting with the highlights at the bottom to kind of focus more on um, more, more on where more on where light reflects and less on just trying to bring the gradients to the top to accentuate the turret because there's different ways you can approach it I mean both ways work that one with the wet effects I chose that one um, for the book because I knew it was going to be one of the main ones that I focused on and mm -hmm. I I didn't have a, a vehicle of that color. But I knew with um, on the side with those tracks, the way they come over, like the way they come up and over part of the side like that, I could do all kinds of effects with that. And that muddy look, that after I added all the weathering in the thick mud tones, I just brushed on um, Vallejo still water over it. And uh, that's how I got that look with it. That one, yeah, yeah. Uh, built that for me. I, I didn't build that one. Um, really? collector, actually. Oh, nice. Man, yeah. I, I just love it. Yeah, yeah, M Expression helped me with the decals on it. Um, did a good job on those. And that was the one where I found four or five different examples with different effects. Uh, it's, it's an LVT, right? Yep, LVT. Yeah, that's where I got. Yeah, that's where. And I took all the stuff I liked the best off those vehicles and just put them on that one and um that's one where i really exaggerated the colors and it made it all just came together at the end um, a lot of my book a lot of the stuff on filters that that was the, in my book was the focus of of that model. awesome awesome yeah, thank you yeah john says uh, the kv1 that has a million views on youtube that was a great great one as well yes john hale yes um that was another one. I did not worry about the weathering. It's a KV. I've never seen one that looks remotely clean. So, yeah, that one was done. That was my uh, colleague would, we would shoot the next day and I'd spend the next rest of the day into finishing the effect we filmed that day. That was a lot of work. You know, I had to get it done quickly. We had a figure for it that was all painted and we lost it. <laughs> And like, uh, I don't know what ever happened to that figure, but I ne we never found it. We just misplaced it. And but yeah, that, that those videos were that 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 was a lot of work. So you know, putting together those videos and everything, and you know, of course, you run into disagreements and you're tired. So you know, there was a little back and forth, but that happens. But at the end, you know, we were both happy with what we got. Nice. Okay. Well, how we how we doing on time, Adam? You still got a, a few more minutes with us? Yeah, sure. People are still interested. Can someone read that? What is that? Uh, what is a hey PP and a PPP and Adam uh, turning in late, but got to start from the beginning to not miss any of the the gold. Yep. Yeah, it looks like he's gonna gonna watch the stream um, afterwards. So that's okay. that's great. Thanks um, for coming on, Kyle. Yeah, 
Well, um, Doug, we haven't heard much from you. Uh, uh, what are uh, maybe, maybe what's one of your favorite builds that Adam's done? Well, you already brought it up. It was that uh, KV2 Walker. That was it. Just it was really cool. I love the design and I love the finish on it. Thank you. Um, um, I know, I know, it's not your design, Adam, but uh, but I, I think that the I, I actually looked it up on on I just googled KV2 Walker and there's a bunch of ideas out there that people shared and that's the only one I've seen that actually looks like it would act might maybe work. It's not unbalanced. It it looks like it actually is put together really well. So yeah. that's what I saw on that. And then the finish, um, like you said, making that turret look look like it came out of a out of a bog, but the rest of it looks modern. That was that's that was a, a great finish on that. Thank you. Yeah. Then when you're doing stuff like that, especially like theoretical vehicles, um, you got to be careful to, like you said, to build them in a way, if you're going to scratch build them in a way where they look, um, you know, plausible. Like I'm doing a Panzer IV with the, uh, what is it, with the, um, with that, that hull that, with all the angles that came out of one of the, uh, was it a Hillary Doyle drawing or something? And it, it was like the Panzer IV K, and it had all. It was supposed to be the next Panzer IV. It had all the sloped armor, and I'm trying to put that together. I scratch all that. I'm putting it all together. I someone sent me a, a, a resin master, and I made my own. And I mean, the resin master was great. I just I, I made my own because I wanted to make the well seems a little differently. And um, I'm realizing, like, okay, how do you service the transmission now? You don't have those flaps that open on the front to go into, or was it, I think it was a change of brakes. We need David Parker here again. <laughs> you look at the front of a Panzer IV, you've got these rectangular hatches that came up. I think it was for the brakes. And there was a, another square hatch that you could take off. I think it was for the transmission. So now I'm like, okay, well, how did they do that on this? How are you going to get the transmission out? How are you going to get to those brakes? And, of course, with the machine gunner, the way it's set up, the machine gun is going to be right in his face. So he's not going to have room. I'm realizing all this stuff now, and I'm still thinking, okay, how am I going to make all of this work and make it look like you can get to that transmission and those brakes? And the MG, the radio operator, has enough room in front there and the vision port for the driver. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You just don't have enough room in there the way that's set up. And I didn't realize that until I'd already had it all together almost. So, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll figure something out. Yeah. You know, those are the fun ones. Those are the challenging ones, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. TJ, what's one of your favorite builds of Adams? I think uh, John has it in his little folder there. It's the, um, the Pacific Sherman. I think has the, it was the AK set on it with the Slat armor on the side, and this is a, yeah, the the Avenger. Oh, yeah, that was a MIG production conversion. Oh, uh, MIG, yeah, that's you one know, of my all time favorites. When I first put that on Miss Links, to be honest with you, I was afraid to put it up, I, I didn't think we would go over. And th that was that one actually went over a lot better than I thought, but that was another one you're know, working with the color modulation and not being afraid of how light you made it. And the weather on that one came out pretty good, too. Uh, I was happy with that one. Some of them just, some of them just come out better than others, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah the tracks look great and the natural metal and, and those everything. Are, those are rubber tracks. Those are rubber band style tracks. Yeah. Wow. I've since learned that the um, those plates on the back, those Pacific Shermans, I, I got that wrong. Um, I did find another photo finally with how those plates look, but it still looked cool. It's fun to paint them. Yeah, just oh man, just never never gets old taking a look at that for sure. Well, that conversion too, it comes with a um, a stencil to make that um, that little slogan on the side. Yeah, I mean, rubber tracks. If you if you know what you're doing your patient you can make them look good yeah yeah i like the little steel plates on the front of it too uh, I, I thought the weather on that came out pretty good i was happy with it 
So uh, Chris Sieber, a.k.a. Luftdrum72, wants to know, has the posse roped you into a machining Krieger build yet? No, but there's a few I want to do. And again, it just comes, and that's a good question. It just comes back to, um, I just, I don't have the time I used to. So uh, what I do, is, there are, there's a lot of stuff. I, there's a lot of sci-fi stuff. I, I even like, I like to do like Star Wars Night Riders. You know? I'd love to have a collection of those. I'd like to have them all. I, you know, I love the Thai Bomber. That's like my favorite one. And um, But it's just, I only have so much time. And I just stick to the 135th armor because I think that's what people want to see from me and what that's what they know me for. And I still enjoy it. I still enjoy it very much. I, I'll always probably be doing 135th scale armor until I can't see anymore. And I got to. <laughs> <so. laughs> yeah. So, yes. Um, <laughs> John, I mean, what's, what's one of your favorite builds that we haven't talked about yet of Adam's? Oh man, I you know again I I love Naked Desperation. That's my favorite build of all time. Out of all the models I've ever seen, yeah, oh, well, it's, it's so uh, good. Uh, Steve Zaloga told me that I had the wrong turret on that thing, and which we talked about one of the other um, podcasts. And uh, I think I, I might I might do that again. Why not? Just do it over. Try to research it a little better. And, and do it again, see so how I can make it look now. And plus, it won't be so big like that German one you just put up there. The Schutzwagen, oh, yeah. That name. <laughs> um, I don't even dare say that. Um, so, but it, so it'll probably be a lot more fun. I might do that again. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know, okay? But I'm Sounds glad good. you like that one so much. Oh, it's the best. It was posted on Facebook about, I don't know, less than a year ago. I think someone had bought it off of eBay and they posted it. I was like, whoa, where'd this come from? Oh, I know. So. I felt the same way. I'm like, oh. Uh, <laughs> I guess, all right. They sold it. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Yeah. Yeah. Much longer. <laughs> what was that? Adam builds five T-34s for every Sherman. Yeah, I, I love the T-34. I love all the variants. I love the angles. Um, I do like Sherman's too, though, very much, especially now more so than I did. I enjoy it much more. But uh, but the T thirty four, I, I just I built so much of them. I know so much. I know where the flaws are in all the kits. I know how mm -hmm. to put together the photo etch, and I can do it pretty quick. But th there's, there's some cool Shermans out there. People have done over the recent years, and mm -hmm. Sherman was also a very important vehicle, like the T thirty four. They had a lot in common. Mass mm -hmm. produced, you know, simple to maintain, operate, and train people on. And, you know, important medium tanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question. No question. Um, is, is there any kind of subject that uh, you, you see in the near future that kind of goes outside of armor that you're interested in? Would you ever do a ship or maybe I some gonna, aircraft? Uh, I was going to do a V, like one of the original Mad Max V8 Interceptors, the one from the Road Warrior. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. There's a kid out there for it. Um, <laughs> Just probably some Star Wars stuff like TIE Fighters and everything. You know, like those, what is it? The 72nd kits from, is it Bandai? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 They're a little costly, but um, they go together really nice. Just build it from the box and, you know, just just um, just focus on the painting and having fun with the washes and stuff. That's probably what I'll do, and I can hang that somewhere. You know, in the house or something. My, my fiance, you know, she she likes those movies too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've also there was, you know, I've always liked robots too. Um, some of the different robots out there. I got one done. I just never finished it. I just never got a chance to paint it. I just get caught up in other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, got, we. Oh, go ahead. I said I got this too, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. I was just looking at it the other day. Oh, was that Yagpanzer E100? Yeah, well, it's an amazing hobby. Oh, nice. The uh, the skin in World of Tanks has one with like a motorcycle on it and like oh, this geometry around it. <laughs> I, was, I was playing that before I, um, before we started here, just blowing some time. 
And um, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, stuff like that. But yeah, some mm. of the skins on there and everything. And when I first started playing that game, I didn't get into those crazy skins because to me, they weren't historically historically accurate. Yeah. But now I, I don't care. I got all kinds of crazy ones that I've gotten over the years, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and you can, you know, I, some of the th theoretical subjects I put on there you know, what they've done with them are actually pretty good. You know, I, I wish, like the Chinese 111, I wish there was more information about that out there. Mm -hmm. I, that's a cool looking vehicle, you know. And some of them, you look at it too, and you look at how they were designed, I'm like, well, that wouldn't work because of this, this, and this. And I'm like, you know, I, yes, I'd like to take that idea, but kind of build it my own way. Mm -hmm. For but, sure. But still, though, there's really cool concepts on there, you know. Oh, yeah. If Adam does a Mac, we'll blame it on uh, Banana Eric. <laughs> no, uh, we got to blame it on TJ. He got us all hooked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's, he's the headwaters. He's, he's patient zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Adam, if you want to do a Bandai Star Wars kit, you just let us know and one of us will send you one. Is there I would a, love to see that. Maybe. Yeah, well, I, I had one of the uh, TIE Interceptors. But it broke when I moved home from Spain. I had it in my suitcase, and it broke. Mm. Um, but is there, is there a good 70-second kit of the uh, the TIE bomber out there? Not no. yet. We're yeah, unfortunately we're, not. Yeah, I'm looking at it in resin, and I don't dare touch that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I even just having one of the regular TIE fighters, the, the Darth Vader one was awesome, too. Mm -hmm. If you're a Star Wars fan, that was actually a prototype in the movie. I thought that mm. was cool. I thought that was cool. And some of the ones in the new ones, too. What was it? Um, my favorite new Star Wars movie, Rogue One. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the only real good one that fits in with the old ones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the TIE Fighter they had in there, I forgot to name it, and there was a 70-second kit out for that, too. Striker. The striker. striker. Yeah, yeah. It's like kind of the, the solo panels are kind of like over the pod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I love that one. That's cool. That, that's really cool. What's this? Uh, scale model dot. Oh, hey, he's from uh, Instagram, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen him on Instagram. I, I love that. I like his, what is that? It's the picture of Avatar, is that what you call it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know who he is. He does good stuff. Yeah, Jonathan's a good dude. Good dude. We're in a chat group with him. Yeah, good guy. Really so. cool. Yes. Nice. Yeah. All right, we got another serious question for you here. Okay, from Pete. Yep. Um, well, why would you ask? Uh, what is it, Adam? Mandalorian book or Boba Fett? Aren't they both about Boba Fett? Or I, I'm not. I, I'm sorry. I don't quite understand the question. You say which one do you like better, Mandalorian or the book of Boba Fett? Have you watched either of those shows? No, I don't have them. Um, they're only on. What's they're only on like Disney, right? And I don't have yeah. it. But my uh, um, one of my students um, did let me uh, steal his password for his, <laughs> his, 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 his students left um, class. I stayed a little late in the classroom watching it, and I really do like. Um, I like the Mandalorian. I loved it with was it RG eighty eight. Yeah, get him in there. I thought that was great. I really they they just kill him off. <laughs> but I thought that was great. Um, excited when I was a kid, he was like one of my favorite Neil's you know, figures. You know, you had that you wish you kept and didn't blow up with firecrackers and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you do the Roberto Aguilera collection. You know, that was always oh a, man, it looked so different. It was just a cool looking droid. So, you know, you know, everyone loved the droids. Mm -hmm. you know, that's much character. That's made Star Wars one of these made Star Wars special. Was mm -hmm. it? Character the robots had the battle damage all over the ships, the weathering. It, the universe looked old, mm -hmm. and as a kid, I just I never seen that before. You know, I remember just look at the pictures. You know, the impacts on like uh, one of those little skimmers there. They the job of the hot had when they went to the was the Sarlacc. It's called it's, yeah, Sarlacc pit, and pit I, of the, Carcoon. Yeah, I was looking at a picture and a nice color picture. You see like Harrison Ford and. Um, Carrie Fisher up there all dressed up, and you see a big impact in the front of it. Mm -hmm. and actually, I it was a friend who pointed out to me, we were in a story, pointed out to me, as wow, look at that impact on it. Like, yeah, and then my head's already you know, spinning. <laughs> yeah, we're do with that. So, yes. Um, so, is the book of Boba Fett good too? Or, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. all right. 
it's yeah. like it's it. really I think it's really kind of part of the Mandalorian. It's all kind of a story. It's really really well done. I think overall. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, everyone loves Boba Fett, right? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, we're at two hours, Adam. Man, what a treat um, for you joining us tonight and uh, reminiscing with John about uh, some of your older kits and getting to kind of get into your your head a little bit with your weathering and finishing advice. And thanks to all of you out there who have listened and asked Adam questions. Um, man, what a treat to spend some time with you, Adam. Well, look, thanks for having me on. I appreciate all the questions. And um, if I looked a little tired, I apologize. It was a bit <laughs> and uh, it's always, yeah, John, it's always nice to go back to the old days. That was a great idea of yours. And, um, you know, guys, thank you so much for having me on. It means a lot. I'm glad that you know, people still want to hear what I have to say. Well, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. All right. Yep. Thank all you. right. Well, thanks. Yeah again everybody thank you adam for joining us uh we'll do more of these lives in the future to all of those of of you out there listening um we'll have the audio from this in our next podcast which will drop on the 16th so you can uh, listen to this again and john will put some pictures of the builds that we've discussed so you can kind of take a look at those on our facebook page no it's the 16th of march uh february february yeah next week oh Yep. yep Oh, that's right before spring break. So yep. I stay listening to it. I'm not spring break, winter break. Cool. Yeah. All, All right. right. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll talk Thank to you. Guys. Talk Have to you on there soon. Cheers. Thank Take you. care. Later. Yep. Thanks. Bye. All right. <laughs>